Grief is a fascinating process, and it is we are not well served in thinking about it by the degree to which depictions of grief are so far from the mark. There is a way in which things like grief and dreams are depicted very badly in fiction. Uh, and so we, um, we tend not to have a clear conscious relationship with our own grief experience. We'll go through it and then we'll even forget what it's like. Um, but I would argue that grief, A, it is clearly an adaptation. As difficult as it is to face, most creatures don't face grief. They lose an offspring or uh, a, you know, a partner and they move on. Uh, you know, a cat that loses a kitten, a mother that loses a kitten, can't really afford to miss a beat because she probably has other kittens. Um, and so anyway, they don't show grief in the same way that some creatures do. But certain creatures do show grief, and the group of creatures that shows grief is very interesting. So we, we see grief in chimpanzees, we see it in elephants, obviously people, dogs, um, and what I would argue this tells us is that there's something about highly intelligent, highly social creatures that causes grief to effectively be reinvented each time. Because we and elephants and dogs and chimpanzees don't all share some ancestor from which we've inherited grief. Maybe we do with chimps, but dogs and elephants would be a totally separate pair of evolutions. So why would this debilitating state evolve adaptively in creatures that are highly social and highly intelligent? And what is the state? Well, the first thing to realize is think about the way a funeral actually is rather than the way it is typically depicted. A funeral involves people, often somber, but not always. In the same room in a funeral, you will see even the closest kin of the person who has been lost laughing, um, talking about mundane trivialities, and crying. All of these things exist together. And the experience of grief is one in which one will face intense periods of reflection and sadness interspersed with um, everyday experiences, interspersed with periods of having completely uh, put aside this incredible loss. And that period will go on for months. Uh, it goes on actually rather intensely if you've lost somebody close for a full year. In fact, the Jewish tradition involves not placing a headstone until a year has passed after the burial, which I've always thought was a, an indicator of something significant about it, having gone through a full year's worth of holidays and celebrations and seasons without the person that has been lost um, before one memorializes one or memorializes fully. But in any case, uh, I will argue that grief is the downside of love. And what I mean by that is when you love somebody, you prioritize them in your mind, sounds trivial almost, but you prioritize them in your whole conscious schema. Um, you expect them at certain places and times. You depend on them. You integrate them into your understanding of the world. And when they are lost, you have to unintegrate them. That doesn't mean that you forget them, but it does mean that to the extent that somebody was very important to you, that that expectation has to be excised from your active program so that you do not continue to expect them, so that you do not depend on them when they can no longer show up. If 
in the terrible circumstance that it, it's your child that you've lost. You can no longer live uh, with the same um, hmm. obligations. In other words, let's say that you've lost a child, but you have other childs. You have to reschedule everything in what you understand based on the reality that the child that you had banked on um, investing in over their life is no longer in need of your help and your other children are. Mm -hmm. So I would argue that to the extent that we love somebody, that they are deeply woven into our, our own program. And the unweaving process cannot be simple. If it was simple, then the relationship that we had with that person couldn't have been very deep in the first place. So if the relationship was deep, the unweaving of that person has to be deep. And I would argue that the pattern of grief that we experience, where you have these intense periods of uh, anguish that are interspersed with periods of normalcy, and that the periods of anguish become farther and farther apart, but they don't become less fraught until finally they do, that that is emblematic of the fact that your brain keeps discovering places that the person who has been lost was wired in. And at first you find all of the obvious ones, all of the circuits that become active regularly. It becomes apparent that, oh, this has changed and that has changed. And as time goes on, the remoteness of the circuitry that the person was connected to grows. And so the frequency with which you encounter one of those circuits um, goes down. And so in this way, the person finds their memory uh, recategorized so that you no longer are depending on them in a living way. So I agree, it is neither a full excision nor a full transformation. In other words, there are aspects of whoever this person was that are no longer relevant after they're gone, right? One doesn't need to deal with their dietary restrictions, for example, after they're gone, so there's no point in really even remembering what they were necessarily. Um, on the other hand, their insight might be very valuable, and so one might take what one expects of this particular person's uh, view on the world, and they might build it into an internal structure that they can access. So, for example, I know my grandfather was very important to me, and he taught me a lot about how to build things. And he was very, he got a reputation as a safety nut, but he wasn't a safety nut. What he was, was very good at anticipating how things fail so that he could engage risks and not have it come back to haunt him. And he transferred this to me, you know, he would, he would give me a hint about what he thought I was doing wrong and how it might end up coming back to hurt me. And when he died, I remember noticing that it was as if a ghost followed me mm. up the ladder every time I went up a ladder to do some work mm. on some electrical component or um, building something. And I remember as a very young person, like a boy, I think, he warned me about the danger of people leaving things on top of ladders. And I know that when you move a ladder, you, if somebody has left something up there, whether it was you or somebody else, when you move the ladder, you tend to tilt it back towards yourself. And if it's a hammer and you've left it up there, it'll fall right on your head. And so one doesn't think about this when one goes to put something down. You're up a ladder, you don't have enough places to put things. It's very natural to put things on that top space and then to forget that they were there you go down the phone is rung your cup of coffee is ready whatever you go down and then you realize you need to move the ladder and you've forgotten what you've left up there so somebody um, needs to build an extra circuit that checks about what's up there and am I really safe to move the ladder am I certain I didn't leave something heavy up there or something that could fall on my eye or something like that and so I have the sense when I interact with a ladder that my grandfather is there in particular and that he sort of throws a little elbow my way and says, uh, you know, you sure that ladder's clear before you go and move it? Maybe I'm pushing a little far here, but 
is your grandfather just information after he's done or is there like a presence is there a distinct intimacy that persists between you and this person who's gone that that overcomes like that time death barrier yeah i i don't think this isn't um troubling to me at all i'm comforted by the fact that it's not um it's not like my grandfather has become a safety robot that you know the <laughs> alarm bell goes off when i interact with a ladder i'm i'm comforted by the fact that my grandfather isn't really gone that he's been taken you know internal and i like the idea that he looks through my eyes and that things that he never he didn't live to see that you know in some sense i can let him see things that he might have been fascinated by or if i go somewhere in the world he never went and you know i can sort of allow him to see it you know and it's one can torture oneself with you know how literal is this and the yeah. answer is well yeah. it's not really literal at all on the other hand maybe it is because at the same level that you know i am the conscious me but i am also the unconscious me and the unconscious me is aware of things that the conscious me isn't and so you know i can torture myself with whether i'm one people or several and you know among the several there are the people that i've cared about and lost and in any case it's also comforting to me that you know if uh presumably i will die before my children do and they will have known me very well and i feel some comfort in the idea that as long as they live that some aspect of the part of me that mattered will mm. still wander the earth with them. Just not your dietary restrictions. Right, my dietary restrictions, I'm happy to take them with me. <laughs> <laughs> the whole prediction of this hypothesis is that grief's uh, extent will be predicted by certain characteristics. Okay. That the surprising nature of a death to the extent that somebody was really not expected to die because they were young because they were healthy or something like that makes grief all the more intense because you didn't do any of the work ahead of time to the extent that somebody is old or infirm you may have grieved enough by the time they're gone that there's no work left to do and that can actually result in people having um guilt over the fact that they haven't grieved somebody that they believed they cared very deeply about and frankly we need to free ourselves from that because if somebody's been really sick and so your brain knew they were going to go and it prepared by doing the work ahead of time it's not that you didn't grieve it's that you've already grieved and mm. so you can't say how much you cared about the person tells you okay. how much you're going to grieve um because some of the grief can happen ahead of time um so you know the degree to which somebody is important to you can actually create weird phenomena hmm. the number of people who intensely grieved john f kennedy for example who've never met him and never would meet him right what did that have to do with well in some ways john f kennedy was present in their living rooms week in and week out okay and he was important he had an effect on the way the world functioned and so it wasn't much different than losing an important you know, elder in the community in some unexpected way. There are two big categories. There are people that you depended on whose loss changes really your prospects. And there are people who depend on you and their loss changes your obligations. And it is interesting how similar in some ways mm. those two kinds of grief are. It's interesting that at least in English, we don't have two different words for it. Maybe other languages do. But, hmm. you know, and you can see this in the extreme with pets. The loss of a pet does not change what, you know, what you, who you can depend on. I mean, in the extreme case, maybe, you know, a dog that has a particularly important role in some work relationship might change your prospects but in general the way we have pets these days um the loss of your dog exquisitely painful as it is is not a big loss in terms of what you're capable of doing you can get another dog for one thing um but in some ways they take on the role of you know they're not children but 
they take on that role. For some people, they actually substitute for children. Mm -hmm. And so their loss is um, much more shocking and uh, painful than people expect who haven't been through it. Um, so anyway, those are two big categories. People you depend on, yeah. and people who depend on you, or people or pets that depend on you. Those things are both very painful. And then the question of the, you know, the entertainer or something. David Bowie dies, and yeah. people, uh, my age at least, who paid attention to him feel some terrible sense of loss. And you know that, in one way, is is a novelty phenomenon. You know, we wouldn't have had access to some iconic distant figure that we would never have met who contributed to our lives. On the other hand, he really did contribute to some of our lives. And it's not so surprising that when somebody who has created mental architecture, right, exploring some parameter, you know, Major Tom meant a lot to many of us. And um, the loss of the creator of that idea, somebody who gave us a window into this sort of existential angst of an astronaut and its relationship to um, drug addiction and all of that, that those are really rich, powerful concepts that um, enhanced life for many of us. And to know that the unique mind that created those things won't be creating any more of those things, is it is a real loss, mm -hmm. even if we never met them. Mm -hmm. So here's the problem, actually. There is a bomb-proof way to get people to remember how to pronounce Weinstein, but <laughs> I can't use it. Why not? Is it too... It causes problems. What? It causes bigger problems than it solves? Indeed. Well, yeah, well at least you're smart enough to take your own advice, then. I guess. What's the, what's the secret? Uh, it's like Einstein with a W. Oh, well, yeah. You just can't say... It's like Einstein, you know? Yeah. Sounds bad. But that means like I'm... Like the bagel company, Einstein's. Like the bagel company! <laughs> I think you may have just solved the problem, dude. <laughs>